uh, exclusionary politics and the use of Arabic online, um, the cultural implications of the concept of fake geek girls, and a um, on something on the relationship between the maintenance of social media profiles and our understanding of the body. I'm Austin Brown. I'm a writer and researcher out of Chicago, Illinois, and I study the relationship between uh, popular culture and our understanding of the self. I'm Natalie Morcos from Toronto, Canada, and I'm primarily interested in prime performativity in virtual spaces. We'll be your moderators for this panel. Here with us today, we have Jeff Pooley and Meredith Salisbury. Um, Jeff is an Associate Chair of Media and Communications at Muhlenberg College, focusing his writing on the history of media research, the history of social science, scholarly communications, and consumer culture and social media. Meredith is a Statistics and Media and Communications double major, also at Muhlenberg College, researching social media and authenticity. We also have Imen Shahata, who is currently working as a researcher in the A2K40 Center at the American University in Cairo. Their interests include uh, material culture, body politics, and pop culture. Next up, we have Joseph Regal, Assistant Professor of Communication Studies at Northeastern University. Joseph's current interests include life hacking, geek feminism, and online culture. And finally, we have Heather Holmes, who's a writer and artist whose work has appeared in The New Inquiry and Replacing Philadelphia. So our project starts from an observation that social media sites claim emphatically and frequently that <laughs> sorry that their platforms for authenticity. What is odd we thought is that these sites issue their authenticity proclamations as rebukes of their competitors in authenticity. These cycles of authenticity one-upmanship isn't slowing down. Upstart services like Beam or Peach continue to define themselves as refuges from the pervasive inauthenticity of incumbent sellouts. Timeline is really the story of your life on a single page. Check a check a check my space. Uh, it's not relevant to talk about certain things with certain people. Especially my guy friends, you know, that I don't fill them in on every aspect of my life, whereas I might with my girlfriends or my mom or whatever. Whisper is totally anonymous, so you can share what you want without worrying about what your connections or followers or friends might think. Share your thoughts, make new friends, be yourself. One of the things that I'm most excited about is that Ello will never show you ads, never sell your data, and never do the creepy things that ad-based social networks do. The vibe here is really positive, and I hope you stick around and have fun on Ello. You see, social media, it's supposed to be a digital or virtual version of who we are as people. Instead, it's this highly sculpted, calculated, calibrated version of who we are. The point is that the pattern of new services calling out predecessors' insincerity gets repeated with numbing regularity. With that pattern as backdrop, we make three claims in this talk. The first one is broad and informs the other two. We should take authenticity more seriously. If only because services routinely proclaim themselves as sites for authentic self-expression, and many users avowed commitment to presenting themselves as authentically as possible and to seeking out others who seem to share the same commitment. 
The second claim is that authenticity as an ideal is fundamentally unstable. It, by definition, it is characterized by what we are calling reactive dynamism. The idea that social media services, one-upmanship, we argue, is an expression of this core instability in fractal form. Our third claim is that the dy this dynamism has produced an array of competing authenticity ideals. Um, one anchored in spontaneity, for example, another in creativity, and another in segregated audience, and so on. We found seven in all, and each is exemplified by a major network. Okay, so here are the uh, sites that we looked at, um, and most of them were chosen for their peak U.S. popularity. Uh, a couple of them we added, actually, um, that were kind of supplements. Uh, recent upstarts, you saw Beam, uh, Plague, the social sharing uh, startup, and Peach. Um, and they were there in a way just to see if the pattern that we found was getting repeated. Um, so since we were interested in kind of the reactive dynamics over time, um, our idea was to uh, actually look at these sites uh, and services all the way back to when they were founded in each case. So Friendster back to November 2002 and uh, look at every six month interval of, of the sites as they evolved over time. And obviously with the special attention being paid to their authenticity claims. Uh, and we found, uh, and so we did this with all of the sites except those most recent ones, which obviously don't have a Wayback Machine um, history. So we also just supplemented this with statements from CEOs uh, to the press, with videos uh, that companies sometimes posted, or even blog posts that are made by um, companies themselves. And uh, here is just a uh, kind of timeline of these sites. And this isn't exactly when they were founded, but instead you see here the first screenshot we got from uh, the Wayback Machine. And so uh, you see there's a, a kind of interesting gap here um, from Tumblr in 2007 all the way to Instagram. And it sort of is a cluster that I interpret as being a kind of reaction to the high profile IPOs that made some billionaires right around that time or just before then. Um, but we're taking, uh, we take these services all the way through from 2002 to March 2016. It's sort of like a 14 year time lapse video of the internet, and in particular of uh, social media authenticity claims, all the way to Peach. How many people have Peach on their phone right now? Okay, some proud folks. Oh, good. So, uh, right. Um, so, uh, just to, to continue on, that we, uh, before we you know, kind of ruthlessly uh, truncate our findings. Um, I did just want to say a quick word about authenticity itself. Um, and in particular, uh, the um, existing literature that's on social media and the self, there are a few papers that do kind of center on this issue of authenticity. And there's a much, much larger proportion of articles, book chapters, papers that look at um, authenticity in a kind of glancing way. But our sense is overall that we don't pay enough attention to authenticity, that we don't take it seriously enough. Um, one of the expressions of this is the way in which we, many of our, many scholars actually are, um, express a kind of definitional uh, evasion, I would say, uh, an unwillingness to define authenticity. For example, this sort of surprising passage in uh, Sarah Benet Weiser's recent book on, on authenticity uh, includes the passage, the authentic is tricky to define. Its definition has been uh, the subject of passionate debates involving far-ranging thinkers. Uh, I am not offering a new definition of authenticity, etc. Another uh, issue is that um, when it comes to authenticity, we uh, are um, in a kind of understandable, if headlong rush to place scare quotes around the term uh, to kind of gleefully deconstruct its contradictions. Um, that knowing stance, uh, you know, of course authenticity is a construct, has the look and feel of a sneer or, you know, at the very least, a kind of embarrassed smile. Um, and, you know, we, I have the sense anyway that we trip over ourselves to um, convince each other that we're not taken in, uh, which is all fine and good, of course. But one consequence is that we don't take seriously enough the morally resonant ideal that speaks to many people. Um, and so our claim is that, you know, authenticity is real. Um, it's real in a relational sense, right? Um, it's a reaction and an unstable one against perceived inauthenticity. So our relational understanding is, you know, authenticity as a reaction. Um, 
It's not about correspondence um, or the idea that there is, you know, some authentic self um, unique to each of us and inside of us. It's, um, it is instead that, that we are, um, that, we, that in, a, in a phrase that authenticity is a kind of unstable reaction to uh, perceived inauthenticity. And the instability is self-propelling and dynamic. Okay, so, you know, um, th there is such a rich body of literature on authenticity outside of media and cultural studies, broadly speaking. And in particular, um, Charles Taylor's Still Unsurpassed Sources of the Self, uh, Lionel Trilling's uh, Sincerity and Authenticity, Marshall Berman's All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, and Arlie Hochschild's The Managed Heart um, were especially kind of articulate expressions of the uh, view of authenticity that we're putting forward. And so with Taylor in mind, um, you know, he tells this ridiculously grand uh, story of the rise and emergence of, of authenticity as an ideal. Uh, and he identifies three sort of core aspects of what authenticity is, at least as it relates to the self. Um, and the first is that each of us has a kind of unique and original self. Um, but it's one that we don't know, that we have to actually discover, um, preferably on backpacking trips to Europe or, or something like that, right? Uh, and that's why we find ourselves. And he says that this moral ideal also calls on us to express that self if we do find it. And our view is that, you know, Trilling in particular is especially good at identifying something that Taylor misses, which is that authenticity in the 20th century, uh, above all, is a rejectionist ideal. It's about uh, denouncing society, about distancing yourself from the conventional uh, in art, in culture, in politics. Um, and Berman and Hochschild are especially articulate about the way in which capitalist culture is, you know, willing to embrace the authentic as a sales tactic, as a kind of a very effective way to get people to part with their dollars. Um, and, uh, you know, in a cu culture that is, you know, suffused with self-branding rhetoric, we all are um, asked to be true to ourselves because it's to our strategic advantage. Um, and this is something I've referred to elsewhere as kind of calculated authenticity. And the experience of calculated authenticity, the pervasive experience of it, is one that, um, one re that, that uh, leads to a kind of reaction, a desire to yearning for the real thing. Okay, um, Meredith will take over. <laughs> So in the old days of social media, we were surprised to find that they made relatively few claims to authenticity. And instead, Friendster, MySpace, and Facebook all presented themselves as places to connect with friends with like the emphasis on connection instead of like displaying yourself. And for Facebook, we, from the beginning, we, it, Facebook invoked from the beginning this idea of nominal authenticity and the notion that you should present a single identity tied to your real name. And as Zuckerberg famously said in 2008, you have one identity. The days of you having a different image for your work friends or coworkers and for the other people you know are probably coming to an end pretty quickly. Having two identities for yourself is an example of lack of integrity. And faith Facebook's thin nominal notion of authenticity, like all notions of authenticity, is rife with contradictions, but indeed these contradictions are exactly what news sites reacted against. And in, in the interest of time, we're going to fly through the seven types of authenticity that we found, and each of them reacts to Facebook's nominal authenticity in a different way. Twitter from the beginning stressed the importance of quick real-time updates, so their authenticity was a product of immediacy. Whereas Tumblr and Instagram had versions of authenticity that put the accents on creativity and expressing yourself. And Google Plus, which is now a ghost town, was sold on its ability to combat context collapse and restoring the audience segregation of face-to-face -face sharing. And Snapchat, along with Vine, both um, kind of found their authenticity and spontaneity and the fleeting candidates that liberate users from permanent social media like Facebook. And anonymous apps like Whisper found their authenticity in like the freedom to share your thoughts without reputational consequences. And Yik Yak as well, blog posts definitely pointed those out. And then Peach, which was a new addition to our collection of apps, um, proclaimed its authenticity in emotional terms, complete with its magic words and its embrace of emojis. Okay, 
Um, the, the final of these seven uh, varieties of authenticity that are all kind of reacting against Facebook in a way is the, in some ways the most obvious one. It's the anti-commercial variety um, and best exemplified by Ello itself, which, it, which interestingly has taken a kind of pivot itself to become more of a Tumblr um, creative network style um, social network, but nevertheless um, uh, abides by this identity as the anti-Facebook. And just as a way to suggest that this dynamic that we've been identifying is ongoing, that it continues to be uh, here. I'm going to show you the opening um, website view of a relatively new social sharing um, upstart called Plague. <laughs> okay, and it's really hard to read there in the bottom, but you can either select tell me or it says there, oh, uh, it's actually a little difficult to read for me too, but... Um, <laughs> it's like everything is fine the way it is. Okay, it says, oh, everything is fine the way it is. And if you click that link, where are you taken? Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about um, my presentation, which is titled "You Can't Chat with Us," which I'll be mainly talking about uh, authentic Egyptianness and on online scripts or scripts that you use uh, to communicate online. So uh, I'm going to be mainly analyzing through like these slides. You're going to be see like you're going to see that I'm going to be analyzing social media discourse. Uh, specifically looking at Twitter and Facebook uh, that articulates a link between authenticity and the scripts that you use online. So uh, to start off, I'm going to have to explain to you guys, okay, so I'm going to look at two kinds of scripts in this presentation, which is the Arabic script and the Franco-Arabic script. So I'm going to have to explain to you what Franco-Arabic is, okay? Uh, All right, so uh, as we can see, uh, this, these are the words in Arabic script, and this is how they, like what they mean in English, and this is what Franco looks like, which combines uh, the Latin script and Arabic numerals in order to uh, communicate in Arabic. So as we can see here, for instance, uh, the Arabic numerals kind of replace sounds that can't be conveyed through the Latin script, such as seven for ha or five for ha. Okay, so... Um, Franco-Arabic, or Arabic chat alphabet, as most commonly known, was mostly developed during um, late 20th century as a response to the pervasiveness and exclusivity of uh, QWERTY keyboards and Latin script. So in this sense, it was kind of considered as agentic, given that people wanted to communicate in Arabic but couldn't, so they used Franco, or this uh, script, in order to do it. But however, um, once that the Arabic script started appear like once the Arabic letters started appearing on the keyboard, um, everyone started like it started can, being considered an outdated trend, like Franco. Okay, so um, I'm going to be looking at the dynamics of performance and discipline within the context of online scripts, which I've already mentioned, and I'll be looking at self questions such as how could use of certain scripts be a way of ass asserting authentic selves online, and how could use of Arabic script or lack of it uh, convey something about one's identity, and how is the inauthenticity of those who use specific scripts, in this case Franco-Arabic, uh, imagined? Um, all right, so recently there's been a lot of like public discourse conceiving of social media and Franco uh, since it was produced on and for social media platforms as um, 
as a danger to the Arabic language and its sanctity. So as we can see, like the purity of Arabic itself was seen to be compromised by this mix of, um, uh, of, thing, of aspects from both Latin script and uh, Arabic language. So as we can see, for instance, this is one of the headlines and um, the caption says that the influence of social media platforms and their danger, like it's talking like, about this. Okay. Um, however, while there, this discourse kind of um, demonizes social media in a sense, given that making it seem as if it's compromising the sanctity of Arabic, we could see that social media, um, I mean, we could see that this could be traced, or these purist arguments could be traced to uh, Egypt's modernist phase in the 1800s in an offline context where colloquial or informal Arabic was considered to be a threat to classical Arabic, and uh, specifically when it was being used in print. Uh, so as we can see, for instance, through um, Ziad Fahmi's book on, on, on ordi called Ordinary Egyptians, um, um, religious and conservative elites engaged in a process of vulgarizing colloquial, and it's also important to note that this period, late 1800s in Egypt, was important for um, national formation of national identity, so the link between language and asserting authentic Egyptianness was very prominent. Okay. So in parallel to how colloquial was vulgarized in the late 1800s, we could see that there's a similar process of vulgarizing scripts like Franco, where they're considered to be aesthetically inferior to Arabic, and um, not, and, okay, I'm sorry, one minute. Where many, many are actually refusing to communicate with people who speak in Franco. So um, this is based on, or I'm kind of adapting this concept of aesthetic distancing, where it's not really, the refusal is not based on the content itself, but based on the scripts and how the shape and form of the, the scripts. So, um, yeah, as I already mentioned, Franco is considered to be aesthetically inferior to Arabic, and it's also considered to be uh, less authentic and less beautiful, and also given the fact that Arabic itself is the language of the Quran, or like holy scripture, that adds a lot to its uh, authenticity. So, um, as you can see, for instance, here, um, one of these memes, uh, here are bubbles of people speaking in uh, Franco-Arabic, and... The, uh, the, the character in the meme is kind of asking them, who are you? So as we can see here, there's an imagination or a creation of an authentic we that does not tolerate these scripts and does not want to engage in contact with people who use them. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to move from a process of vulgarizing Franco-Arabic uh, script to, shame, uh, to shaming those who use it. So there's been a lot of trending hashtags such as, why do you speak Franco? And... As you can see here, the, the tweets or like the, the screenshots that I've taken are mostly in Arabic, but I've put some uh, uh, translations for them. So um, here we see, for instance, um, how people are using this hashtag in order to perform their authenticity. Where, like, uh, they're, uh, for instance, we have claims like, I type in Arabic because I'm an Arab and my great -grand grandparents are Arabs. Or, and it's also interesting to see how through hashtags like, why do you speak Franco? Um, people who speak Franco are conceived of. So a lot of, a lot of instances, they're conceived of as lacking culture, or as we can see, for instance, here, uh, people who use Franco themselves use this hashtag in order to show how they're, um, just, they provide justifications in a sense to uh, show that they're not inauthentic. So here we have, it, for instance, something like, uh, I use Franco because I'm too lazy to switch keyboards, or I use Franco because um, uh, my parents are sitting next to me, so I don't want them to understand what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there are specific, also there are specific regulations and codes on how to text such as you need to either text in Latin script or in Arabic script. And as you can see, for instance, these examples, people are applying the instructions that they're giving. So they're saying it's better for you to text either like Arabic in Arabic script and for, uh, English in Latin script. Uh, okay. So building on literature, on online labor, uh, we could conceive of Franco itself or Arabic script in a sense. Uh, as a commodity or a raw material that could be used in order to perform authenticity online. Uh, so another thing also is that 
which is the last point that I'll be making, is that the inauthenticity of those who use specific scripts is, Im is imagined in terms of social constructions of difference. So basically, uh, Franco, for instance, is seen to be used as something in order to emulate traits of superior classes that have specific background to, or have like access to a specific background. And uh, for instance, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I just, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just, can I <laughs> repeat again? I'm just kind of nervous. Okay, so I'll be making the claim or argument that the inauthenticity and inferiority attributed to those who type in Franco is shaped by social constructions of difference, specifically, in this case, class relations. So online rhetoric on and shaming stress how use of Franco itself reflects what Veblen called emulative consumption. So in a sense, uh, they're used as an attempt to emulate traits of superior social classes who had a specific background and access to private education or access to the Latin script. And uh, we also see a lot of regulatory claims that, such as you need to remember who you are or you need to remember where you came from and you need to stop trying to be something that you're not. Uh, okay, so it's also interesting to see how uh, through these processes of shaming, while the main focus is on Arabic and Arabic script, there's also uh, an interest in, or there's, we can also see how English itself is seen or highlighted as something supreme, as a, English itself, the language, which we can find claims such as Franco shows how bad your English is, or they don't know how to type in, uh, uh, they, they type in Franco because they don't know how to speak English. So it's interesting to see how Franco still has like a supreme uh, value in, in all of this. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how uh, online scripts themselves and the inauthenticity of those who use Franco is imagined in terms of binaries of, of sex. So it's not just in terms of class, but also in terms of gender. So the, those who use Franco are seen to be, uh, or there's a link or an imagination of inauthenticity itself as being feminine or something that women do. So uh, for instance, here we see how the claims such as what kind of man types in Franco or uh, I feel like girls who type in Franco are pretentious or trying too hard. So this and the inauthenticity of people who, sp who speak this specific script is also imagined in terms of, uh, of, of gender and performativity. Okay. So I thought this meme, wait. This meme was interesting because in a sense it showed how um, these specific scripts are embodied or take a human form. So here, the, the caption says, uh, this is how I view those who use Franco. So everyone's replying in the Arabic script, but as we can see, the person in the middle is replying in Franco. So, um, uh, so in a sense, Arabic script here is imagined to embody real men which uh, I mean, that perform masculinity through uh, body language and shape, as opposed to the person who's in the middle who um, embodies Franco, and as you can see, they're all ganging up against him and in a sense stressing how inferior and illegitimate he's seen to be. All right, that'd be all, oh, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Joseph, and my slides are just a web page. So if you'd like to follow along, you can just go to uh, regal.org slash talk and follow any of the references you want to. Let's see if I can maximize this. Okay. And I'm going to talk to you today about policing, the policing of identity and social contours. And I'm going to do it by way of a really interesting discussion that happened a couple of years ago about fake geek girls. And I think this discourse was well exemplified by these two images. In the first image, we have a young woman took a picture of herself with her nerdy sort of poser glasses, and she wrote nerd on her palm, and she's making a claim of nerd identity. 
But this image was appropriated by pranksters, lulzers, trolls, and whatnot online, and turned into an image macro. An image macro, you take an image and you stick some subtitles on it, and these subtitles threaten or challenge or undercut the legitimacy of her claim on nerd identity. So in this case, the woman is confusing the character Wolverine with the actor Hugh Jackman, and so they're saying she's not a real geek, not a real nerd. The other image is a Lego character of the infamous slave Leia gold bikini, and there was a really interesting discussion about that too. So those are the discourses that I'm going to be referencing. I'm also pulling from certain literatures, including subcultural capital, like what is a subculture, what is valued within those subcultures, what's considered legitimate. I'm also going to be pulling from identity work. And finally, I'm going to follow uh, Christina Busse, who did some really does great work in fandom, and her looking at how in fandom, how geekdom is both gendered and hierarchical. But first, I think I should talk about what are geeks and what is policing and those sort of things and how this whole conversation actually started. So this conversation was kicked off by a post by uh, Tara Tiger Brown. She wrote at Fortune. So these sort of posts of boundary policing had happened before in geek spaces, but she wrote in a very prominent mainstream space. And she complained about women who were there in geek spaces, like at conventions, seeking attention and overshadowing real geeky girls who were enthusiastic and passionate about their interests and wanted to share about their interests. And so she said, attention seekers, you should really be considered exhibitionists and young women, please don't let that sort of derail you from really being passionate and pursuing your interests. And this prompted a discourse that in some ways became unsavory, which I'm gonna talk about. But what again is policing? So there's various definitions of policing out there, but when I began looking at this discussion and thinking about it, I think two things are really important to understanding policing. There's a reciprocal definition both with respect to identity claims and claims about a subcultural community. So for example, for me to prove that I am a geek and make an identity claim, I'm probably going to reference things about a particular community. Simply, if you're going to police the boundaries of a community, you're likely going to do that by way of looking at the identities who make claims of geekdom within that community. So that's my understanding of policing. And with respect to geeks, I define geeks as people who are very enthusiastic about something. You could be a reef geek, but typically it's online, fan, computer type cultures. And in my work of looking at geeks, I think there's two different types of geek archetypes. The first is represented by comic book man from The Simpsons. Here's a quote from him from Simpson, from, from Bart in the comic book store, in which the comic book guy says, I could explain something to you in Navi or Klingon, but you're so beneath my attention, I'm not even going to bother. I think there's another type of geek archetype out there. That's the one that is fond, close to my heart, and that's the geek who really loves to learn and share. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that at the end. So now I want to go back to Christina Busa's uh, really great article about gendered hierarchy within fandom. And she makes use of this Foxtrot comic in which the young boy character who's really into Lord of the Rings is so excited that the movie trilogy is coming out. But m much to his great frustration, his sister is equally excited about the movie. But it's not because of this arcana that he's interested in. It's because she thinks Orlando Bloom is attractive. And this just wrecks him. And... Subsequently, this led to a whole Foxtrot book entitled Orlando Bloom Ruined Everything. And so Busa rightly noted that where fans are allowed to put their attention is policed in a gendered and hierarchical way. Some things are considered more worthy of attention in geekdom than other things. And I'm extending this model by looking at policing with respect to the movement of attention or what I call contested contention. And so I think this fake geek girl discussion was about three things related to attention. First, what is attended to? So in Pierre Bourdieu's sense, there's cultural capital, the stuff that we have in our head. Some follow-on theorists have also talked about erotic capital, degree to which we're able to command attention and shape and affect the world through our seemingly attractiveness or social skills. And so the entrance of some of these women, sometimes potentially dressing in sexy cosplay, seemed to prompt this debate about what was more important. Is it the cultural capital or the erotic capital? 
Uh, there's also this question of by whom, whom is attending the geeks in these particular spaces, and what is the meaning of the received attention? And I'm going to say a little bit more about each one of those three things. So first, there's the question of knowledge versus attractiveness. Subsequent to Brown's post, in which he was encouraging young women geeks not to be put aside by the uh, exhibitionists, some men took up the refrain and definitely, I think, added an androcentric and potentially even sexist tenor to the conversation. So here we have Joe Peacock, Peacock writing a blog on CNN. Again, I was surprised to the degree to which this conversation was happening in the mainstream, where he ended up making use of a character from the Star Trek universe called Seven of Nine. She was a Borg character who was put in the series apparently because she was an attractive woman and they were trying to get more geek fanboys interested in the show and she wore this uh, skin-tight catsuit. Uh, he makes reference of, well, these women are really six of, uh, sixes out of tens in the real world. These women are not attractive, but they put on a Batman t-shirt and they come to conventions and they're considered a nine. And this is an invasion of the geek space. Similarly, I think there was this question of, is it geekdom attention or is it even now mainstream attention which is being fought over? Because we all know now that geek is supposedly chic. Marvel Comics and DC Comics are putting a new uh, blockbuster out there uh, every weekend. And so this is a big space. And so here we have a comic book uh, author, creator, taking Peacock's uh, kind of creepiness to an even greater level on a screed on Facebook. Um, and I didn't quote those aspects of it uh, because he was really attacking the attractiveness and, and, um, of women. But here he's talking about, I helped build up this scene at these conventions. This is my bread and butter. And I'm now starting to get some mainstream attention, but these women are invading and taking up all of my air. So I think there's a contention between who deserves attention, both from other geeks, but also from the new uh, wealthy interests of the mainstream audience. And then finally, there was a really interesting discussion about what is the meaning of this attention? Some women who might wear the Slave Leia costume said, this is a costume of empowerment. I've always maybe been a little bit shy or maybe a little bit ashamed, but I can put on the Slave Leia costume and feel empowered. Because yes, Slave Leia was changed, chained to the horrible uh, Jabba the Hutt, but what did she do in the end? She choked the shit out of him, killed him, and rescued everyone, and they succeeded. So this is a costume of empowerment. But other women said, be that as you may with respect to your intention, the context of a movie for, by fanboys for fanboys um, and history means that it's inherently objectifying and you can't really sort of make this claim. So that was a very difficult conversation to which I don't think there was any easy answer. But I did notice something about the conversation. First, fortunately, I think particularly by way of John Scalzi, a famous science fiction author, who when he weighed in said, I am the speaker of the geeks and I outweigh all of you, he said the thing about being geeks really is not about policing, about hoarding your knowledge over other people, about shaming other people if they don't know as much about Doctor Who as you do. Rather, it's meeting someone who shares your enthusiasm. That's what being a geek means. And I thought that was an important turn in this conversation about geek identity. Also, as I alluded to, Women faced a lot of double binds in this conversation and in this space. So for instance, if you dressed sexy cosplay, you might be considered a slut, but if you just dressed as your ordinary nerd, you might not get any sort of attention. Um, or in a lot of these spaces, a woman is too geeky in the mainstream space, but not geeky enough in the geek space. Um, and in particular, the way that this conversation boomeranged having started from a woman trying to encourage women to be active and participate into a scrutiny of women, both with respect to their cultural capital and the erotic capital, uh, was unfortunate. That said, one of the folks that participated in this conversation, he too got befuddled by this, this conversation about, you know, what is the right thing to wear at a convention? And he, instead of cosplaying Slave Leah, he did what's called cross, cross play. <laughs> so this was his ultimate sort of um, engagement with the discussion, which I thought was interesting. But I'm cramming a lot in, uh, in these 10 minutes, and I do want to leave you with just a couple of basic insights, I think. 
Um, first, subcultures are particularly gendered and they're hierarchical. This really shouldn't be a huge surprise, but it is, it is interesting to look at the ways in which subcultures are gendered and hierarchical. Secondly, my notion of uh, uh, policing, I think it both entails a reciprocal definition and relationship between identity and the social contours of the group that we're talking about. Uh, third, I think if we want to understand geek spaces, fan spaces, we should really pay a lot of attention to attention, because I think this is one of the major capitals in those spaces. Um, negotiations of identity and social boundaries, I think, are dominated by the existing culture. So this conversation happened in an androcentric and sometimes sexist culture, historically predominantly, and I think that's why this conversation took that turn. And I think by way of that redefinition of a geek identity as people who love to share their enthusiasm, I think more progressive understandings can emerge in these conversations, but it is not without a cost, particularly for people that are marginalized or minorities in these communities and trying to enter these communities. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussion. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm not a student or a researcher, so it's really nice to have some sort of like structured space that's also casual. Um, and to that end, I would also like to thank in particular um, Gary Kafer and Wilmer Wilson, who really um, helped me with articulating these ideas that I'm still definitely My web page is still on struggling through. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you just close, you close my browser and then go over and control W. <laughs> Maybe you should do it. <laughs> How do you unmaximize a web page on uh, escape? <laughs> this is this is yours? Uh yeah, yeah. Maybe, sorry. That's just the web page. Right. How do you do that? It's still Apple on Safari, two? so we can just. Yeah, if you just quit. Yeah, Safari. there we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, my AV is pretty minimal here, um, but. I wanted to um, there we go. Um, I wanted to sort of put up for the most part this tweet from my friend Jamie because um, it's something that I think about a lot um, and it's it's like a tweet that I returned to when I was thinking about this presentation so um when we talk about selfies, selfie culture, and the ever-growing discourse surrounding self-imaging practices, what are we really talking about? The oft-quoted line from Anne Hirsch goes that whenever you put your body online, in some way, you are in conversation with porn. But there's also a way in which whenever you use social media, in some way, you are in conversation with your own physical body, whether or not you choose to take or post selfies. My own nascent research in this line of inquiry is mostly interested in the ways this inescapability of the body has been exacerbated by the onset of Web 2.0 vis-a-vis the user profile. Understanding social media as inextricably tied to the physical body, and perhaps even itself embodied, might be a way to edge ourselves out of this corner of selfie discourse, which can feel like an overthink piece dead end. The body's presence has been felt on the internet since its early days, even before the user profile became the dominant mode of digital existence. At the beginning of social media as we now know it, Dana Boyd was conducting research from 2004 to 2009 on teens making or not making the shift from MySpace to Facebook. The resulting paper, White Flight and Networked Publics, 
revealed that this shift in social media practices often occurred along lines of race and class, effectively debunking the utopian notion that existing social conditions were somehow changed or did not carry over to digital space. In a notable passage, one white student, Boyd, interviewed classified MySpace as, quote, ghetto. So bodily specificities were present after all, even with the ostensible choice to not include pictures of oneself in a profile. Facebook emerged with a streamlined aesthetic, standardized, clean, literally and demographically white. Boyd's interviewees spoke of MySpace, on the other hand, as, quote, ghetto, tacky, creepy, unsafe, and unclean. The disembodiment hypothesis, which holds that somehow cyberspace could decouple the physical body from the virtual self, was structurally debunked. Even in our current moment, with the standardized one-size-fits-all layout of our dominant social media platforms, the user profile still performs a disciplinary crystallizing function upon the physical body in ways that are similar to what Boyd mapped in her research. In a Web 2.0 linguistic turn, the user profile is always ultimately imagined as a corpus, whether in casual, corporate, or academic conversations. And when social media platforms themselves are conceptualized as bodies, it engenders a normative discourse around the bodies of users themselves. The most successful users of social media know when to grow their profiles by filling them out and posting through them, when to exercise restraint, and when to trim back friend friendless posts and hashtags. Women who, came along, women who came of age alongside the internet poured over 17 and cosmopolitan tips on pruning, trimming back, and thinning out just in time to apply these regulations digitally. Queer people faced with coming out, which itself is already a strangely spatialized and embodied figure of speech, navigated how far exactly to step. Would it be out of the closet and into the timeline or somewhere else? In the digital, in the digital ecology, it came to pass that the worst misstep was to offer up too much of yourself, to be in excess on the internet. This linguistic overlap between the maintenance of social media profiles and of the physical body created a digital mirroring of normative body politics. As always, it's a matter of just enough and not too much. It may also be worth noting that attempts to describe Web 2.0 at its outset often referred to connective tissue. As in the case of the blogger who posted, quote, I've always found the web metaphor for the internet accurate but somewhat lacking. Spider webs are symmetrical and the real web is lumpy. This language cut both ways too, like the one doctor who wrote on his personal blog that, quote, connective tissue is our body's internet. But the inescapability of the body, the mirroring of the body on network spaces is not merely a linguistic phenomenon. The overlap is also structural. In 1980, Deleuze and Guattari asked, how do you make yourself a body without organs? The body or bodies in question manifest in both a physical and theoretical sense in their text, 1000 Plateaus. Or as Deleuze writes in a letter to Foucault, this body is as biological as it is collective and political. A body without organs, not, a body without organs is not a space, nor is it in space. It is matter that occupies space to a given degree. That's a direct quote from the body without organs. Much like the blank form of social media user profiles, the body without organs is, quote, made in such a way that it can be occupied and populated only by intensities. Borrowing from embryology, Deleuze and Guattari see the body without organs as something constantly emerging and coming into being, rather than something that exists before the organism. Deleuze and Guattari would likely resist my making a parallel between social media and the body without organs, and there are definite differences. They envision it as a site of uncoded flows, certainly not a space governed by administrative dictates. And yet, we agree that you don't need a physical body to be constituted as a body. Um, to illustrate this point further, I've included a picture of the Facebook account I manage as part of my job on, um, on behalf of the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. This ICA Phila account has been around forever and has been superseded by a, by a proper page that people can like instead. But this page um, and the way it demands answers from an arts institution about relationships, places you lived, 
uh, family and education always catches me off guard, both in Facebook's sort of habeas corpus for the user profile and in turn our assemblage of a body by proxy on behalf of the ICA. I often wonder what our different bodies look like and are constituted of on Facebook versus Twitter versus Instagram versus Tinder and so on. Another problem that arose on Facebook was its real name policy, which effectively restricted or deactivated the profiles of queer and trans users, drag kings and queens, and um, Native American communities in particular, by insisting that names of certain users were irredeemably fake. In this case, Facebook's desire for the user profile to be as indexical as possible to the physical body informed a host of administrative decisions that made it clear that the body is written into the user profile in so many ways. This move implicated the body squarely in Facebook's policy making and kicked non-normative users off the site as a result. But it also reinscribed the bodies of users that remained on the site within a normative, Eurocentric, obedient, non-messy body politic. To consider that we might always already be partaking in self-imaging by the mere fact of engaging with social media isn't always comforting. Sometimes it's too much just to have one body, much less two or three or several. But what it could do is offer a potential pathway out of the selfie broadcasting discourse that accepts either narcissism or radical liberation as its last word. I felt my little corner of the internet heave a collective sigh of relief with closing the loop, Arya Dean's excellent takedown of the radical potential of the white feminist selfie in the new inquiry last month. If we can find a way to conceptualize a structural selfie, a platform-based selfie, an always present fact of self-imaging, perhaps we can find a new way to relate to our own bodies, both on screen and off. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to our panelists. We're going to get the Q&A session going, and we have a question to start us off. So this is for Jeff and Meredith. You mentioned how authenticity seemed to be achieved by newer platforms through this distancing technique, uh, which they used a marketing language to separate themselves from the legacy platforms that came before them. I'm curious to know if your research went into the contents of those platforms and discovered whether or not the language persisted through the user experience, because if you think about it, the contents of the platforms are quite similar. They're real-time sharing of moments and content. Um, and I would be interested to know how you saw the distancing take place surrounding those bits of information. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, we just looked at the marketing materials, the, you know, the about sites, the... Um, we looked at the home page shots. Um, in some cases, as you saw, statements from CEOs and maybe promotional videos, but it was all the site's own self-portrayals of themselves. So we didn't get into the user experience, um, the design, or actual users um, and their behaviors at all. But the fact that you point to the, you know, to the similarities is interesting because it's part of the dynamism we're talking about, that every site claiming that it is um, authentic in reaction to another is um, easily undermined by the fact that it's so similar in its experience. Um, you know, f the, the fundamental to reasons why the sites could each kind of claim that the other before it is inauthentic were, on the one hand, the fact that each of these companies is in the business of making money, right? They're, they're interested in uh, bundling their users and selling them for, um, to serve advertisements. And that core contradiction um, could just lead to one and another and another sites um, successively reacting against each other. But and, and I guess the second major way in which you could explain how this dynamism, this kind of constant and endlessly repeated reaction happened is just through the very simple fact that these are asynchronous platforms that allow for editing, for filtering, for, uh, for, for um, performative control of various kinds. And to the extent that we still kind of talk about real life as being, quote unquote, real life as being uh, more spontaneous, it's always possible for the next social network that's after Beam or after Peach to s point to the inauthenticity of Beam and its particular kind of uh, way of posting. So 
Um, there, there are two major reasons why this kind of claim making against Facebook, but against um, predecessor legacy platforms won't stop. It'll keep going. Um, unless there are some kind of like nonprofit real time sort of uh, network, I suppose, which is a VC idea. And then I had a question for, I guess, the whole panel. Um, many of you framed uh, a lot of your research in this sort of oppositional um, interactions and the idea that authenticity is this desired um, attribute sort of for self actualization that requires Earth to be an other. I guess I was wondering. Is there any um, way to navigate that space of sort of that desire for self-actualization, for um, you know, authentic belonging, if you will, without sort of framing it as an oppositional or um, the relation as being negative? I don't know if I would necessarily call it oppositional or negative. I was very much influenced by Pierre Boudreau, who talks about the formation of fields. And if, 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 he, if he looks at a society or a culture, he's looking at the discussions, the arguments that are happening. And so I just see that as a natural part of, if we want to understand what authenticity is, we have to look at the conversations of people arguing about what's authentic and what's inauthentic. So that just seems an inherent part of human nature in, in, in terms of defining ourselves uh, are personally and also the groups to which we exist. And maybe just to quickly add that, you know, instead of oppositional, um, it's possible to say that authenticity is always relational. It's always in reaction to uh, something that's perceived as inauthentic. And that doesn't make it fake necessarily, it just, you know, or the fact that authenticity has a traceable history uh, doesn't make it fake. It just means that it uh, doesn't have a kind of correspondence status to something fundamentally real. So yes, there are contradictions in the notion of authenticity, but it, you can still talk about it as a relational fact that um, is, is, um, gains meaning in opposition to what's perceived as inauthentic. Thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up to the audience now. If you have any questions, uh, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Yes. <laughs> I would say 2004. Yeah, that's that's sort of the framework of, I would say that's when the shift began. Um, and that's the framework of um, the sort of research I've been doing over the past two months. I guess that, the, um, I guess that's sort of uh, the date given for Web 2.0. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, in the back. You know, the thing is, I feel like a lot of people feel that maybe, okay, so everyone that I've talked to, I've always been like, yeah, it's very important to speak in Arabic, and, and as you said, we have to fight the hegemonic structures online. But I'm not saying that, of course, it's a valid point, but I just thought it was very interesting how this formation of authenticity itself, for those who use Arabic script, was based on uh, delegitimizing those who don't. So in the sense, this hybridity, that Franco is described by was very important in, to, in consolidating 
uh, authentic identity itself for people who use Arabic script. So I just thought that was interesting, but obviously um, this is uh, such a valid point. And I mean, specifically for actually like uh, political activists or like leftists, a lot of them would refrain from using uh, a Franco because like if it's the post is itself is serious, then they would want to make it uh, be in Arabic script. Yes, in the middle. Yeah, I think so. I think this is typical for any subculture, maybe even a larger culture, because any culture is a subculture. And in the paper I wrote about this, kind of related to the earlier question, I said that this is just sort of natural to subcultures. And very often, if a subculture does feel like aspects of its authentic culture and capital are being appropriated or misused, um, they do have the ability and the right to sort of resist it, maybe to police it. I'm not against policing whatsoever. Um, and so I just think that's a natural part of social behavior. Um, the thing that I'm a little bit critical here is the way that the, the policing kind of uh, exhibited all these typical double binds for women and kind of boomeranged back on the women so that both their uh, intelligence and their bodies were under the critique of the male gaze. So I think the process itself is kind of natural and inescapable and happens in lots of places. Yeah, at the front. Um, my question is, uh, thoughts on authenticity, is authenticity possible or even desirable in such a broadly public forum as like as the online? I, I know it, everyone's always trying to basically sell that to us, um, but it seems like authenticity in some ways just fuels like data-driven capitalism and all these things. Um, and I, I'm curious what the, you know, I'm curious what the... <laughs> It's a good question, we're thinking. <laughs> I mean, that's such a large question, and it's sort of outside the scope in a way of uh, what, what we were thinking about. But I mean, it's, it's a question in essence of like, is authenticity as an ideal desirable? And uh, the answer that I would put forward is that it just, it, it has a history and has a kind of hold in certain parts of the world, increasingly more of them. Uh, it has a kind of traceable history and grew up in reaction to developments like the rise of the individual and the um, rise of, of kind of scientific rationality and the black satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution and reaction to those developments, uh, you know, and in, in, in 19th century uh, romanticism is its kind of core expression. Uh, and whether or not it's desirable or not, it is to some extent speaking in a way of the kind of, of the West, it's part of who we are. It is something that uh, animates lots and lots of people who do feel this moral ideal, this moral compulsion to find who they are and express it. And even if it's not sort of f tr fundamentally true in some uh, um, ontological sense, it's true in the sense that it's widely felt. And it also provides a kind of critical purchase because the extent that authenticity as an ideal is held up is, is sort of animating the culture, you can criticize the culture by its own standards in the trivialized, uh, um, uh, bastardized versions of authenticity that come through in advertising or in self-help culture or in kind of 
new age uh, um, pro cultural appropriations and so on. So you can use it as a kind of historically emergent critical standard that doesn't have any kind of um, permanent structure. It has a history. Uh, uh, there's nothing fundamental about it, but it can be used to internally critique society. So I guess in that sense, it is part of who we are using the word we very, very um, hesitantly with a, a quotation marks around it. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, yeah, so I don't actually, um, authenticity wasn't a, a framework that I was really thinking about with my presentation. Um, um, partially because I agree so wholeheartedly with the, um, the first um, presentation in that I think it's purely relational. Um, and I just, I, maybe, maybe it's just too much for me to wrap my head around, but I, I just don't see, um, I don't see a way for there to be an intrinsic authenticity. Maybe I just need to find another word for it because I, I don't think like, I think authenticity like intrinsically, um, loops in another besides yourself. So I'm not sure, I wouldn't know a way in which to like cultivate an intrinsic authenticity. <laughs> so in that way, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's um, like possible, but maybe, maybe I just need to find like a different vocabulary for it because I'm not, I'm not not interested in it. <laughs> and I do think it, it like implicates social media um, in a direct way. Yeah, I think authenticity is valuable, but it can also be commodified because it is valuable. So then the question is, how do people police the commodification of authenticity? And so much of this literature looked at a uh, punk subculture because their authenticity is so very much important to them. And they came up with these terms of, you know, if you are a mainstream sort of person trying to come into the subculture, they may consider you a poser. And if you are within the subculture, but then you get the attention of the mainstream, you're a sellout. So they had all these terms for negotiating that sort of boundary and the commodification of the authenticity that practice within the subculture is supposed to create. Um, so it's just, it's just a fascinating performance, and particularly in punk culture, one of the most authentic moves you can make is to disclaim the very authenticity you're building. So you say, I'm not punk, but you're punk in every other way. <laughs> including saying I'm not punk. Like disclaiming an identity is one of the most ingenious ways of claiming that identity. So it's just a really fascinating phenomenon, I think, and it's a negotiation and a performance. We have time for a few more. Does anyone else have something they'd like to ask our panelists? Was that a hand? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just think it's fascinating that you basically use the word authenticity to critique the way that authenticity is used. <laughs> but I, I do feel like um, you made, you put up the slide and you made the claim like uh, that um, authenticity is important, and it was really interesting because if you look at your methodology, you basically looked at corporate media, corporate social media advertising, and so maybe could you state that claim by saying um, authenticity is important to corporate social media advertising? Um, you know, like if you looked at a user's tweet, did you assume word authenticity during that time? Well. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a totally fair point that those are apples and oranges and that we were really looking at, um, you know, promotional materials the, and, and that their claims to, to um, offering authenticity to their users. But the claim about authenticity being important is that it does animate lots of users' interests in using social media platforms and calling out others for being unauthentic and uh, for, you know, using a filter and, and uh, you know, um, and that the dynamics that we identify just with um, social media platforms are reacting to um, presumably the public's speaking broadly interest in finding a way to express themselves. And of course the um, appeals to authenticity from Facebook and all of its predecessor, all of its successors is cynically motivated and so on, but it's speaking to something that, uh, uh, 
they believe will resonate with their users. And so when, I, when we made this claim about authenticity mattering a lot, it's, it's not to say that it should matter or um, that it has to matter, but that, it, that they're making a calculated claim about this being a um, powerful marketing message that will resonate with people. And was I using authenticity to criticize authenticity? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just, there is this ideal that exists in the culture that's grown up and that you can criticize, you can use it as a um, historically contingent ideal to criticize its debased, trivialized forms in, in uh, uh, the, the culture. And that's a, a kind of critical purchase that doesn't rely on some kind of universalist norm or the idea that you can identify some you know, uh, it, it is a sort of a, a layabout um, resource, a moral ideal that has purchase, whether it should or not, and it can be used as a critical lever because it's so easy to point out the ways in which it's violated constantly. I'm sorry, can you repeat? Well, I just thought it was fascinating that like, you, know, you had authenticity, you were, you were using authenticity to critique authenticity and you know, you're, you're taking a stance against the base of authenticity. But then in the second presentation, the base of authenticity uh, emerged as something that you valued and were interested in um, in the form of like hybridity and you know, vernacular and cultural immersion. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was interesting, honestly, how everyone kind of talked about similar things but in different ways so uh, I mean I don't know I don't really have much to add <laughs> to that but like yeah. we have room for one more question in the back I <laughs> but I, I just think it's so fascinating the way that if you look at the quantitative, the quantified self movement, which is a pretty weak term to describe it, but that there are all like lots of authenticity claims based on numbers and data, and uh, just like you're saying, and that the, the rhetoric around these QS conferences is just marinated in authenticity talks. So there's no way in which that won't continue in, in the kind of biological recordings that you're talking about. Right. And it will be open to the claim that, um, you know, quantifiable um, biological recordings miss the essence of uh, what our soul is, which is much better captured by Wordsworth in the, you know, romantic Tintern Abbey uh, along the river Wise. And the, the cycle will continue. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good rest of your conference.